Introduction If God invented whiskey to prevent the Irish from ruling the world, then who invented Ireland? The obvious answer might be the Irish, a truth suggested by those words Sinn Féin, ourselves, which became synonymous with the movement for national independence. That movement imagined the Irish people as an historic community whose self-image was constructed long before the era of modern nationalism and the nation-state. There are many texts in the Irish language to bear this thesis out, and a few will be surveyed in my opening chapter. But what they also register is the extraordinary capacity of Irish society to assimilate new elements through all its major phases. Far from providing a basis for doctrines of racial purity, they seem to take pleasure in the fact that identity is seldom straightforward and given, more often a matter of negotiation and exchange. No sooner is that admitted than a second answer to the question suggests itself. That the English helped to invent Ireland, in much the same way as Germans contributed to the naming and identification of France. Through many centuries, Ireland was pressed into service as a foil to set off English virtues, as a laboratory in which to conduct experiments, and as a fantasy land in which to meet fairies and monsters. The 1916 insurrection was a deliberate challenge to such thinking, though often described by dreamy admirers as well as by sardonic detractors as a poet's rebellion, it was an assertion by a modernising elite that the time had come to end such stereotyping. One 1916 veteran recalled, in old age, his youthful conviction that the rebellion would put an end to the rule of the fairies in Ireland. In this, it was notably unsuccessful. During the 1920s, a young student named Samuel Beckett reported seeing a fairy man in the new square of Trinity College, Dublin. And two decades later, a Galway woman when asked by an American anthropologist whether she really believed in the little people, replied with terse sophistication, I do not, sir, but they're there anyway. The underlying process, however, was reciprocal. To the Irish, England was fairyland, a notion developed by Oscar Wilde, to whom the nobility of England seemed as exotic as the caliphs of Baghdad. If England had never existed, the Irish would have been rather lonely. Each nation badly needed the other for the purpose of defining itself. This hints at yet a third answer, pithily summed up by those who say that exile is the nursery of nationality. The massive exodus which followed the famines of the 1840s left hundreds of thousands of Irish men and women in the major cities of Britain, North America and Australia dreaming of a homeland and committed to carrying a burden which few enough on native ground still bothered to shoulder, an idea of Ireland. Wilde believed that it would be, in great part, through contact with the art of other countries, that a modern Irish culture might be reshaped. The implication was that only when large numbers of Irish people spoke and wrote in English, and maybe French and German, would a fully-fledged national culture emerge. That analysis, in its political as well as its cultural implications, was ratified by many other exiles who provided a major impetus for the Irish Renaissance which followed. Though often berated by recent historians for their fanaticism and simple-mindedness, the Irish exiles of the 19th century were keenly aware of the hybrid sources of their own nationalism. They knew, much better than those who remained at home, that the native is, like colonial and creole, a white-on-black negative, and that the nativeness of natives is always unmoored. Benedict Anderson has suggested, as a corollary to those aphorisms of his, that a similar type of exile in the latter half of the 19th century brought many rural peoples into cities and towns where their children, in the course of an ever-extending schooling, were made to learn a standardised vernacular. For the Irish who stayed in their own country, that language was English, and a life conducted through the medium of English became itself a sort of exile. The revival of the native language, led by the Gaelic League in the final decade of the century, was an inevitable protest against such homogenization, a recognition that to be anglicised was not at all the same thing as to be English. 
the colonial elites, who were the result of this flawed mimesis, would become so many white-on-black negatives. And it was from Gaelic leaguers, who painfully studied and repossessed Irish, while continuing to speak English in public life, that much of the impetus for political independence would come. For all of these persons, nationalism evoked an idea of homecoming, a return from exile or captivity, or what Anderson elegantly calls a positive printed from the negative in the darkroom of political struggle. The same might be said of the literary artists. W.B. Yeats followed Wilde and Shaw to London in the 1880s, the approved route for an Irishman on the make in England. Once there, however, he grew rapidly depressed at the ease with which London publishers could convert a professional Celt into a mere entertainer, and so he decided to return to Dublin and shift the centre of gravity of Irish culture back to the native capital. Cynics have suggested that a literary revival happened in Dublin at the turn of the century because five or six people lived in the same town and hated one another cordially. The quip captures the vibrancy and occasional malice of the personal exchanges, but it does scant justice to the collaborative nature of the enterprise. That enterprise achieved nothing less than a renovation of Irish consciousness and a new understanding of politics, economics, philosophy, sport, language, and culture in its widest sense. It was the grand destiny of Yeats's generation to make Ireland once again interesting to the Irish, after centuries of enforced provincialism following the collapse of the Gaelic order in 1601. No generation before or since lived with such conscious national intensity, or left such an inspiring, and in some ways intimidating, legacy. Though they could be fractious, its members set themselves the highest standards of imaginative integrity and personal generosity. Imbued with republican and democratic ideals, they committed themselves in no spirit of chauvinism, but in the conviction that the Irish Risorgimento might expand the expressive freedoms of all individuals. That is the link between the thinkers as disparate as Douglas Hyde and James Connolly, Hannah Shee Skeffington and James Joyce. My concern has been to trace the links between high art and popular expression in the decades before and after independence, and to situate revered masterpieces in the wider social context out of which they came. Hence chapters of political and cultural history, analyses of urbanization, of vernacular, of debates about national culture, and the program of the Gaelic League, take their place alongside detailed re-examinations of major texts. Although my book is broadly chronological in structure, it sometimes cuts back and forward in time, recognising that any age is always constructed by another. My aim has been to explore continuities between the Irish past and present, to place the Irish Renaissance in a constellation with the current moment when, it seems, Ireland is about to be reinvented for a new century. Nobody who has lived through the denial or distortion of so much of the Irish past in recent years as various groupings sought to colonise it for their own short-term purposes, could be unaware of the ways in which an act of criticism may be at the mercy of the present moment. Doubtless, many of my own insights may be conditional on certain blindnesses, which are nonetheless regrettable for all that. I have tried in what follows to see works of art as products of their age, to view them not in splendid isolation, but in relation to one another, and, above all, to celebrate that phase in their existence when they transcend the field of force out of which they came. There will always be a silent reference of human works to human abilities, and to the limitations of time and place. But it is wise to recognise, despite current critical fashions, that certain masterpieces do float free of their enabling conditions to make their home in the world. Ireland, precisely because its writers have been so fiercely loyal to their own localities, has produced a large number of these masterpieces, and in an extraordinarily concentrated phase of expression. The imagination of these artworks has always been notable for its engagement with society and for its prophetic reading of the forces at work in their time. Less often remarked has been the extent to which political leaders from Pierce to Connolly, from de Valera to Collins, drew on the ideas of poets and playwrights. 
What makes the Irish Renaissance such a fascinating case is the knowledge that the cultural revival preceded and in many ways enabled the political revolution that followed. This is quite the opposite of the American experience in which the attainment of cultural autonomy by Whitman and Emerson followed the political declaration of independence by fully 75 years. In this respect, the Irish experience seems to anticipate that of the emerging nation states of the so-called third world. Yeats also insisted that art offered this kind of anticipatory illumination. He said that the arts lie dreaming of what is to come. He wrote for the coming times, as did his friends and colleagues. They would all have understood the force of Walter Benjamin's observation that every age not only dreams the next, but while dreaming, impels it towards wakefulness. These are the responsibilities that begin in dreams. In restoring writers to the wider cultural context, I have been mindful of the ways in which some shapers of modern Africa, India, and the emerging world looked at times to the Irish for guidance. Despite this, a recent study of theory and practice in post-colonial literature, The Empire Writes Back, passes over the Irish case very swiftly, perhaps because the authors find these white Europeans too strange an instance to justify their sustained attention. I hope that this book might prompt a reassessment. All cases are complex, but it is precisely the mixed nature of the experience of Irish people, as both exponents and victims of British imperialism, which makes them so representative of the underlying process. Because the Irish were the first modern people to decolonize in the 20th century, it has seemed useful to make comparisons with other subsequent movements and to draw upon the more recent theories of Franz Fanon and Ashish Nandi for a retrospective illumination. If Ireland once inspired many leaders of the developing world, today the country has much to learn from them. This is in no way to deny the specificity of each particular case, and I have tried, in teasing out some analogies, to render the crucial differences as well as the often forgotten similarities. In that spirit, I have refrained from attempts to recolonize Irish cultural studies in the name of any fashionable literary theory, preferring to allow my chosen texts to define their own terms of discussion. My belief is that the introduction of the Irish case to the debate will complicate, extend, and in some cases expose the limits of current models of post-coloniality. If nationalism is most often evoked in Western Europe nowadays by those who wish to defend the status quo, in Eastern Europe and in the wider decolonizing world, it may equally be an inspiration to those who wish to change it. The Irish case, as always, exhibits both tendencies at work, often simultaneously. A few definitions may be helpful at this point. Imperialism in this text is a term used to describe the seizure of land from its owners and their consequent subjugation by military force and cultural programming. The latter involves a description, mapping, and ecological transformation of the occupied territory. Colonialism, more specifically, involves the planting of settlers in the land thus seized for the purpose of expropriating its wealth and for the promotion of the occupier's trade and culture. Students of these processes have traditionally devoted most of their attention to the economic and political ramifications and have tended to underestimate the cultural forces. Recent work by Edward Said, C.L.R. James, Albert Memmi, M. A. Césaire, as well as by Fanon and Nandi, has helped to illuminate the cultural politics of resistance movements. But there is still much to be done on the implications of empire for the life of the home country. Because Ireland, unlike most other colonies, was positioned so close to the occupying power, and because the relationship between the two countries was one of prolonged, if forced, intimacy, the study of Irish writing and thought in the English language may allow for a more truly contrapuntal analysis. In my judgment, postcolonial writing does not begin only when the occupier withdraws, Rather, it is initiated at that very moment when a native writer formulates a text committed to cultural resistance. By this reckoning, Shethron Keaton and W.B. Yeats are post-colonial artists, as surely as Brendan Behan. As far as the Irish were concerned, colonialism took various forms. Political rule from London through the medium of Dublin Castle, 
economic expropriation by planters who came in various waves of settlement, and an accompanying psychology of self-doubt and dependency among the Irish, linked to the loss of economic and political power, but also the decline of the native language and culture. Although imperial rule in 26 counties ceased in 1921, many descendants of settler families continued to hold much land and wealth. In the ensuing decades, Ireland became part of a new world system, which saw the collapse of colonialism in most of its outposts. That new system was, of course, dominated by the Americans, who, learning from the mistakes of predecessors, concluded that there was no need to rule vassal states, and so were content simply to own them. Once again, Ireland, because of its strategic position in the Northern Hemisphere as a major supplier of American immigrants, found itself in a complex relationship with a great power, and one which was on this occasion also a republic. The resulting ambivalence is traced in later stages of this book, which shows that the effects of cultural dependency remained palpable long after the formal withdrawal of the British military. It was less easy to decolonize the mind than the territory. Such a program was made even more difficult by the persistence of British rule over six counties of Northern Ireland. Even today, the Unionist elites remain committed to an England of the mind, which has long ceased to have any meaning for most inhabitants of a multicultural Britain. Inventing Ireland, though long, is bound together by recurring and developing themes. It begins with an outline of the Anglo-Irish antithesis as a slot-rolling mechanism devised by the English. Against its either-or polarities, both Wilde and Shaw offered a more inclusive philosophy of interpenetrating opposites. This became the Yeatsian method, defined most fully in a vision. The androgynous hero and heroine represented natural refinements of such thinking, to be explored in the very different works of Augusta Gregory, Yeats, Joyce, Singh, and Elizabeth Bowen. A corollary was the notion of the self-invented man or woman. Nietzsche had said that those who haven't had a good father are compelled to go out and invent one. Taking him at his word, this generation of Irishmen and Irish women fathered and mothered themselves, reinventing parents in much the same way as they were reinventing the Irish past. Throughout that process, as Singh saw more clearly than most, there were major reversals in the relations between mothers and daughters, fathers and sons. Families split into the constituent parts, and the free person was born. The link between such self-invention and a Protestant spirituality was explored in a whole set of texts produced in the 1920s and 1930s as an implicit critique of the alarming new tendency of Catholic Ireland to equate itself with nationalist Ireland in the early years of the Free State. All of this put into even sharper focus the meaning of the debate about national identity, which had been initiated by Douglas Hyde and the Gaelic League in 1893 and which registered the choice as one between nationality or cosmopolitanism by the turn of the century. Were the Irish a hybrid people, as the artists generally claimed? Exponents of multiple selfhood and modern authenticity? Or were they a pure unitary race, dedicated to defending a romantic notion of integrity? These discussions anticipated many others which would be heard across the Third World, in Ireland, as elsewhere, artists celebrated the hybridity of the national experience, even as they lamented the underdevelopment which seemed to be found alongside such cultural richness. At the level of practical politics, the green and orange essentialists seized control and protected their singular versions of identity on either side of a patrolled border. But the pluralist philosophy espoused by the artists may yet contain the shape of the future. The century which is about to end is once again dominated by the debate with which it began, how to distinguish what is good in nationalism from what is bad, and how to use the positive potentials to assist peoples to modernize in a humane fashion. Each section of my narrative opens with an italicized interchapter, which briefly sketches political developments so that readers who wish can map literature against the blunter realities of history.